<laughs> All right. Let's see here. See if we got any viewers. Guys, if you're on the stream, go ahead and give a comment. Um, today we're going to be going over how to find tenants for your good quality tenants for your rental properties. Uh, and so you can get them rented in under two weeks after your you get the property or the old tenant moves out. So this stream, guys, I'm going to be going into a few different methods that I use. Um, if you, this is not legal advice, not financial advice. This is just, just what I do. Um, we're going to be going over how to find tenants and then how to communicate with them and then screen them and, uh, you know, go about the whole process from, you know, fi uh, finding, getting the leads, screening them, and then going ahead and uh, signing leases with them and collecting the rent and uh, moving them in giving them the keys. So um, we're going to be going over all that today. So I don't know how long this is going to take. Uh, if we have any questions, we'll answer those. But um, this is going to be a great opportunity to learn. Uh, I have, uh, I'm Dan Cohan. I have nine units of long-term rental property that I own. And I have successfully kept them, gotten them all rented and um, kept them all at 100% occupancy probably over 95, 97% of the time. Uh, the only times I've had vacancies, I've filled them. I think the longest one was uh, like two weeks or three weeks and I had that month paid for anyway. So I really have not lost any money to vacancy because of the methods that I'm going to teach you. And not only have I uh, not really had any vacancy, but also been able to rent all my properties at basically top dollar um, two good quality tenants that have been paying the rent every single month with these methods that I'm going to teach you guys. So, um, now I don't want to do any a fluff or anything, so we're going to get right into the stream here. Um, but yeah, so basically how do I go about, uh, so finding tenants in the first place, um, that is through a few methods, which are very simple and very easy to do. And this really is not, um, you know, finding screening and moving tenants in is really not, you know, it's just like anything. Once you learn it, once you kind of do it a few times and master it, um, it's a pretty simple, repeatable process. It's not rocket science. You know, people are not a mystery. Um, they can be, you know, tricky. You have to make sure you're asking the right questions, make sure you're vetting people properly. But um, by and large, if you just follow some guidelines and principles, um, you should be able to get some good quality people in your properties and um, and you should be able to have a very successful career as a landlord. Um, now, you know, getting the difference, getting good tenants is one of the critical skills that, uh, is, is critical for a real estate investor, especially one that is going to be self-managing their properties. Now I recommend, you know, especially starting out to self-manage your properties because, you know, I've talked to for a few variety of reasons. One is, um, you're going to want to learn this skill anyway, because even if you eventually get a management company, um, you're going to need to know how to do it. So that way you can check their work. And because um, if you don't know how to do it, they can, you know, do a, a poor job or a crappy job. And you're really not going to know the difference because you'll, you've will you never done it yourself. Um, secondly, you know, any rental management company or manager, they don't really, especially if they're a company and you're simply a client, um, they really just don't care as much about your stuff as you do because you're just a number, you're just a client and they have other clients. Now, I think if you get to the point where you're, um, you're big enough, you have enough units to where you can actually hire a full-time like live-in manager or something like that. Maybe when you get to 50 or a hundred units, um, that's probably a different story at a certain scale. Or like if you get into commercial property, you know, where you have the enough units to support a dedicated professional person to manage your property. I think that's a different story because then you can get somebody that really cares because they're just working for you and you're not just, you're actually their boss and not just their client. So they're going to care a lot more because if they lose you, they lose their, um, they lose their uh, job and they lose their money. So um, I would, this is a skill you're going to need to learn if you're going to get into rental properties. Um, the other thing is, you know, finding the good tenants and, and bad tenants is the difference between having a fantastic experience as a landlord 
and a terrible experience as a landlord because um, tenants are really going to make your break your business and finding them is going to be the critical skill that's going to make it succeed. I mean, ultimately, the tenants are your, your customer. And um, if you can find really good ones that are, um, you know, they, they take good care of your properties, they pay every single month, um, they treat your property like it's their own. Um, they keep it up. They tell you when things are broken and, um, you know, they, they tell you to fix them or they fix them and they just take really good care of things. Um, it's going to save you a lot of headache and hassle. Um, you know, just it's going to alleviate 99% of your issues because, you know, most issues come from, you know, primarily tenants not paying rent, which is the worst, uh, or they're late or they, you know, not pay. And then you have all sorts of problems like evictions and, and just a whole bunch of mess, right? Um, you know, when tenants don't take care of things, um, they can pay, but they might not take care of your stuff. And, um, they, you know, then you get the property, they move out and you've got a whole rehab to do, right. That costs you all the money. So, uh, and then, you know, a multitude of other problems if you don't get this right on the front end, but you know, while that's scary, if you do get it right and you get good people, you use the things I'm about to teach you and you, uh, implement them and you be selective, then you're not going to have to experience all these issues. You know, people is a skill and it's an art and a science. Um, but you know, these things will help you that I'm going to teach you are going to help you get the right people in your properties. So um, looks like we've got one viewer on the stream. Let's go up from zero last week. Um, that's great. If you're here, chime in the comments. We'd love to see who you are. Um, okay. So I'm going to, this is going to be a little bit of me talking as well as I'm going to show you guys some of the tools that I use to find and screen people. Um, so if you have a, say you have a property that's just been vacated, uh, or you just, uh, you know, purchase it or, you know, somehow acquired it, it's empty, needs a tenant. Um, the first thing you're going to do is need to rent it. So you're going to need to list it to find tenants. So the first thing you're going to do is, um, get, you know, you're going to want to clean it up. So if you, if you, Hey, it's Kyle Devlin, let's go. Hey, Kyle, welcome to the stream. Thanks for coming. Uh, but the first thing you're going to need to do is fix the property up if it has any uh, or, or update it. Like if it's uh, needs some, you know, holes in the wall filled or, you know, the floors, carpet replaced, things like that. You're going to want to really clean it up, make it look nice, make it look presentable, get the lighting really good. Uh, and then you're going to want to take pictures. So, um, you know, and so the picture is really going to make or break your property because that's where people are going to see it. Uh, and then that's what's going to make them decide to eat, to come and look at it or not. Right. So getting good pictures is, is critical. Um, I've been doing my rentals, just shooting them on my, you know, Samsung uh, S22 Ultra, which is a pretty high end phone uh, with a really great camera. And um, I haven't had a problem with rentals, you know, just shooting pictures on my phone. It's a lot cheaper and a lot uh, quicker to market than, you know, hiring a professional photographer. If you had a, uh, you know, a higher end rental that may be harder to get tenants into, I would definitely recommend professional photography or if you have some like an Airbnb, like I'm going to set up an Airbnb, I would definitely recommend getting professional pictures because um, those pictures are not just going to sell one person. They're going to sell thousands of people. So um, that's going to make or break your business. Um, once you get that, you're going to want to write a good description. The description is probably not near as important as the pictures, to be honest. Most people just look at the pictures and they don't really read the description, you know, but you need to say the critical information like three bed, you know, to the beds, the bathrooms, the rent, the deposit, you know, any pet fees, any, um, any, uh, you know, application fees, processing fees, you know, your policies, smoking policy, things like that. You want to have those things in the description. You want to have any highlights about the property that uh, somebody may not know. Usually put like the school district in there uh, for the high school, you know, those kind of things that are going to be uh, very critical to, uh, you know, maybe say what kind of neighborhood it is, like if it's safe, if it's close to something cool, like, for example, my property up here is like right across from a lake, um, which is one of the only properties, probably one of the closest properties to a body of water in the whole town, which is really neat. It's also close to walking trail. So anything like that, um, you want to put that in there. Um, but most people probably aren't going to even read the description. They're just going to see the pictures and be like, oh, that looks cool. You know, I want to live there. Um, so once they do um, for so once you have all that stuff, you have your description written, your pictures taken, um, you're going to want to list your property. So um the two places that I go and that I've gotten basically all my tenants from is Zillow and then Facebook um, for listings. So both of them are free. Um, Zillow just recently went to free rental listings um, for 
for listing your rentals, they do have a paid option. You can pay like, I think it's 40, 30 or 40 bucks um, to go ahead and upgrade it to the pro version, which they'll give you more exposure. And honestly, you know, I would probably do that on all of my listings because if you think about it, like, you know, say you have a listing, a rental for $1,200 a month, um, one day of, of vacancy is $40, right? So if you literally, you know, get that property rented a day early because of, you know, paying for that advertising, um, then you're going to, you're going to make that money back. And most likely you're going to probably rent it faster than that. And so I would probably pay for the Zillow upgrade. So they give you more exposure because, um, people don't think about like the cost of not making money. Um, you know, like if your property's not rented, you're actively losing whatever that per diem is the, the per day rate of that property's income. So you need to get that thing rented as quick as possible. But that's saying that, you know, you don't just want to throw any trash tenant in there. You want to, um, you know, get the best tenant because that tenant's going to take care of that property for usually, you know, a year minimum um, for most places. So you're going to want to be pretty choosy. Now let's get on to, so that's what I would do. I would recommend Zillow and Facebook for listing your property. Um, for, I like Zillow the best personally, because typically um, people on there are very highly intentful looking for rentals. Like you don't go on Zillow rentals uh, unless you're looking to rent a property, right? And like you can, the the parameters are such that people on there are very, uh, they're very highly in, in temp. Like if they're messaging you, they're usually a good, a good lead, right? And so, uh, and the other cool thing about it is that usually they have the application already done. There's a Zillow application. I think they pay like 35 bucks or something like that. And they can actually use an application for uh, your property as well as a ton of other ones. So it saves the tenant a bunch of money and it really smooths the streamlines the process for you as a landlord, because you can usually have the tenant go ahead and they're already comfortable with Zillow. So you can usually have them apply right there on Zillow. And that, that way they can spend money there and you get the same application you would as a third party site like rent ready, uh, rental management software. If you guys want to check that out, link in description. Um, that's what I use to screen tenants that I don't get through Zillow. But if you do, um, you want to, you know, you're going to get your, your applications and your leads right through there. Um, I would, if you see a lead, if they don't have a description or they don't have an application rather, you know, I, I call all the leads, right? I call them uh, basically as soon as they come in and try to go ahead and schedule a showing. Um, and you want, because again, like time is money guys, like the faster you get on this stuff, um, the faster you get your property rented, the faster you're going to have more money coming into your pocket, right? Like vacancy is like one of the few things that you can 100% control that's going to seriously affect your bottom line if you let it get out of hand. So, so call your leads uh, on the phone as soon as they come in or send them a message. If they don't pick up, send them a text guys, just don't be afraid. Like, remember they just, they just hit you up to get in your property, right? So, you know, hit them on Zillow, hit them on text, hit them on the phone. Um, you run or, you know, and then like do a quick, you know, if they don't send in an application with hard numbers, you know, do a phone screen. So like some of the questions I'm asking is like, uh, you know, what is your, uh, what's your credit score? You know, what's your monthly income? Or if they don't know, they don't know how to, you know, do their monthly income, you'd be like, Hey, you know, how much money, um, you know, how much money do you make an hour? You know, what is the minimum number of hours that you work in a week? And then you can figure out their monthly income by taking their weekly income, timesing it by 52 weeks, dividing it by 12 months. And then um, that will give you your weekly income. Guys, I'm usually only renting to households that are making at minimum, you know, 3x the monthly rent and household income. And that's before taxes. So like, say I've got a property that's rents for a thousand bucks. The family that, you know, the total income producing people in the household, typically the, you know, husband or wife, um, the whole combination of, of working folks in the house, they need to be making at minimum, you know, three grand to uh, qualify. And this is a, usually a very hard line unless um, you know, they are willing to, like, I had a situation where the, the family wanted to move into one of my houses. The rent was fairly high as a big house. It was like $2,100 a month. And I think the, the, the father was the only one that worked and he was making like six grand a month. And so they were just under that. And he actually prepaid a lot of rent in advance because they had just sold a house. So it was basically like guarantee, like he prepaid all the rent in advance and so I was comfortable letting him move in, move in, knowing that, you know, he's already prepaid, like it's not going to be a problem. Right. But I would say that is a very hard line because 
you know, you people like things happen, people lose their income or they have to cut their hours or whatever. Like you need to make sure that they're comfortably uh, making at least three X, if not four X the rent per month. Um, other thing I look for is, uh, you know, credit score naturally. Now, guys, this is just me. This is just what I do. You can run your business any way you like. Um, you know, certain areas I know credit, like people are, have bad credit in certain areas. And it's just like, especially like in different qualities of property. Um, like if you're in lower, lower class areas, uh, where there's just more people that, um, uh, haven't really kept their credit up and everybody that you're getting is bad credit. You know, that may be something that you need to uh, reconsider or, um, or lower your standards, but I'm most of my stuff I'm looking at, you know, 600, uh, minimum credit for most of my stuff. I mean, if they have lower than that, uh, they're really trying to not pay their bills. And so, um, you gotta be, you know, really cautious about people's credit and like, just if people will, they'll tell you all sorts of tales and things like that. And there's all these reasons for, you know, why they are in this situation and stuff like that. And, you know, the credit score doesn't lie if they have like, and, and even if it does have a certain score, like you need to look at their, their credit application, right? Like, on Zillow and on Rent Ready, um, it shows, you know, like they do the application, they put in their social security number, does a pool on their credit. Um, it's going to show, and I, I can actually, you know, walk you guys through this real quick, but we can, uh, we can check out something, but it's going to show like, um, you know, what their, what their like total utilization is, you know, if they, how, like if they've made their, if, you know, what percentage of their payments are they making on time? Uh, you know, how many accounts they have outstanding and stuff like that. Uh, and so you need to take that in. Like if they're lower, like say they're 700, like they're probably good to go, right? Like the algorithm is, you know, they're, they're good, right? They're probably good at 700. But if you get the lower, like than that, you know, I would, I'm always looking at the whole credit profile, not just the score, right? Because like sometimes they, you know, like say they have like there's a you know somebody has uh, I had this gal call in for my one of my units and she's like she's got you know terrible credit like 500 right like it's that's bad you know if it's like a five that's really bad I mean you really got to be trying and uh, so she's got like 99 percent of all her credit is is used she's uh, like a hundred grand in debt with like bad debt. And, um, you know, just a bunch of like, and you know, I call her, she calls me on the phone and, um, and she's like, oh, you know, divorce, things like that. And I'm like, yeah, that's okay. You know, and people have situations in their lives, not going to lie, but like, you know, you can, there, there's a lot of stuff that's not related to a, a divorce on the credit report, right? Like she's really been trying to not pay her bills and she ain't going to pay your bills either. Um, so I look at the whole thing. Sometimes if people have bad credit. Uh, or lower credit, but like, you know, they've been on a hundred percent on time payments or the stuff that they have is like, um, I don't know what's a good example. Like, uh, you know, uh, like they don't have a lot of outstanding debts or like their, their balances are really low. And maybe they have something on there. That's just like, like they haven't paid like a $30 credit card bill, right? Like they just forgot about it and it's messing them up. Like there's things like that where, okay, you know, this guy's probably going to pay the rent. They just forgot about these things and they're tanking their credit, right? So like, keep that in mind, you know, don't just look at the score and be like, yay or nay, you know, look at the score, take a, take a quick um, glance over the rest of the profile before making a final decision. I would use 600 as your rule of thumb. Uh, any lower than that, probably going to be a no, unless they prepay like three months to six months of rent in advance. Uh, which most people with bad credit probably can't do, unfortunately. But, you know, if they can, maybe consider them. I've had my friend and uh, he's done that with some people or they see if they can get a co-signer um, like the parent or something like that. Um, that can help them as well. But make sure that co-signer does a full full application and stuff like that. <clears throat> OK, so that's the, uh, the, the the core things. You've got your income. You've got your credit. Um, those are your two big metrics for uh, screening tenants. Um, the other things you're going to want to do is, you know, check their background. So you want to uh, check their background and their employment. So you always want to make sure that, you know, with the with a background credit check, which Zillow pools, Rent Ready pools, um, see if they have any criminal history, um, see if they have any evictions. Those are the two things that you're going to want to look, look for for background. Um, you know, criminal history is, uh, you know, it, again, you know, not financial legal advice, but, you know, take it with what you will. Um, you know, 
you can choose to rent to, to folks that have history or not. I have, you know, had an experience with some people that's been okay, but you know, you just have to make those choices. Um, and then with evictions, you know, most of the time, like I'm going to say like hard, no, probably for an eviction, unless, you know, I do have a situation like one of, um, you know, my roommates like uh, had a situation and it was a while ago and I, like took a risk and, you know, he had an, a prior eviction and, but, you know, I, um, he was fine. Like, and I, I was like, you know what, the risk is low for me. So I talked to him, you know, he's, you know, it's, it's really, the rent's really low here. Like he's not going to live anywhere cheaper, you know? So the, like the, uh, the, the risk for me is low given the circumstances of so taking that all into account, went ahead, brought him in, you know, never missed rent in, uh, you know, two years and it's been a great relationship. So, um, you know, you might give people a chance, you know, just like, just, you know, look at the whole profile, look at their whole situation and, um, and, and, you know, make your judgment calls from there. Um, so what's next? So we've got the, we've got their uh, income credit, uh, check their background, check their, uh, evictions. Um, and, uh, you know, like I've had people as well, they've had like evictions or like eviction filings, but they're not, they, they didn't, the eviction didn't go through. Okay. So like they settled with the company or got their rent up. You want to make sure to check for that because I've like seen that on people's reports and they've like, you know, they've gone ahead and paid the company and the proceedings were filed, but they never actually like convicted them and, and did it. Um, so that means they didn't actually get an eviction. They just, um, you know, like uh, it just like, it's, they started the process, but the tenant trued them up. Right. So that's probably okay. Uh, but also can be an indicator if they're in Missouri, like I am, you know, you can also get deeper and like check, uh, like, uh, case net or something like that, which can tell you like if somebody has been in trouble, but maybe not been convicted. Um, and just, you're trying to get a, a, a handle for the people that are renting from you guys. Like you're entering a, you know, a long-term business relationship with these folks and you need to be just like with any partners, you need to be very thorough with your screening, guys. And you, you know, I've been tempted to rent to people that um, don't fit my criteria because they are, you know, a lot of people can spin a lot of tales and people are very convincing um, with their stories, guys. But just the numbers and the facts, they don't lie. Don't ignore things that are clearly red flags. Uh, because they're red flags for a reason, right? Like anybody can make anything, they can downplay stuff, they can make it not as a big deal as it actually is. And you need to take that on to a fact because, you know, past behavior doesn't necessarily indicate future behavior, but it's the best predictor that you can use. Um, the last thing and probably the most important thing is um, verifying their income. So uh, this is the, probably the biggest thing you can do because ultimately, you know, if they don't have income, if they if their income is not legitimate or it's not as much as they say, um, they're not going to be able to pay the rent, you know, regardless of whatever their scores and everything say, like if they can't afford it, they're not going to be able to afford it. And they're, the, you know, they're going to stop paying their bills. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, especially in America, you know, people do not uh, prioritize paying for their necessities before they pay for their uh, their pleasures and things that are not essential to staying alive. So you need to make it a priority to make sure your tenants pay the rent because if they don't, they're going to have bigger problems. Um, you don't want to get your tenant in a situation where you're having to destroy their credit or, you know, evict them or something like that. So making sure that you're being the responsible party in the relationship and, you know, making sure your tenant is qualified to live at one of your properties before they ever get there is going to be hundred percent critical um, to your success as a landlord. So um, make sure to verify their employment history and their, maybe not their history as much, but um, just look at their, you know, their job. Like, again, they, they have to put on most applications, you know, where are you working now? Like sometimes they put like where they've worked in the past and you want to check like, you know, does this person job hop? Are they stable? Um, you know, put their, and you always want to, and then one other thing after this is, is rent references and previous landlord references. You always need to be checking those as well. Um, so like with a, uh, a job, you know, you want to, they are going to give you, you want to make sure you get pay stubs, current pay stubs. Um, and you want to see the hours they've worked, the pay because people put like they put, they say they claim they've made X and then you actually look at their pay stubs and they have it right. Like it's, it's fabrication. And you also want to, you know, verify any additional income that somebody's making. Like if they're making, 
um, they might have a job, but hey, maybe they're making, you know, child support or, uh, you know, maybe they're making something like that or alimony, something like that. You got to verify all that income if it's contributing to qualifying them for the, uh, for the property. And guys, like, like this is like, oh my gosh, it's a lot of work, you know, like the tenant, what if they don't, you know, want to do that? Again, guys, they're having the same issue with every single landlord they're trying to uh, get a property with. And if you have good properties and people want to live in them and they're for good rates, like they're going to, they're going to play the game. They're going to give you this stuff because they want to live there. Right. Um, generally I'm not going to do this until they uh, see the property, right? Like I'm not going to go through all these steps because, um, you know, before they see it, they're really not interested. It's just a, uh, they're, they're not like completely interested in living there. Like you want to get them into the property, show it to them and then ask them, Hey, you know, do you like the place? Do you want to go ahead and here's an application, uh, and see if you can do an application. That's what you want to do before you go through all this rigmarole. You want people that are really seriously, like they want to move in, you know, they're like, I want to move in, you know, what do we need to do to do this? Okay. And you, you'll need to push them to do this. you got to sell the property, you know, again, People are not just going to like wait on you forever to get your ducks in a row. You need to be quick as well, but you need to push your tenants to once they've decided they want to live there, you know, you need to jump on them to get all that stuff and go ahead and push them to the lease signing once you've qualified them because they have other options as well. And uh, you need to commit them to your property, screen them and get them in there once that you've completed a thorough screening and uh, and get them to the lease signing or they will, you know, they'll wig out or go somewhere else or, you know, just like any, any purchasing, uh, and any closing process, right? Um, so the last thing that you want to do is verify the uh, rental history of somebody. Um, and that is through calling their previous landlord or checking their uh, where they've lived in the past. And this can be tricky sometimes, but you know, by and large, uh, it's pretty straightforward. So on any application, they're going to put usually the last uh, two places they've lived. A um, couple key things you want to look at here is, you know, uh, how long did they live there and who are they putting down as their rental references? Um, you do, you only want to call, uh, previous landlords and I would, and I would double verify the numbers they give you with like looking up the, the property, right? Like, like say they lived in an apartment complex and they give you a number. You want to look at, look up that apartment complex and make sure the numbers match, right? Cause they could give you the number of their friend, uh, or, or somebody that's just going to be like, oh yeah, you know, I'm their previous landlord. They were great, you know, but like, they're not their landlord. And this is just like, you know, this might be like overkill, but again, like you do not want to be letting, uh, you know, liars and, and people into your properties because it is difficult to get them out once they're in, you know, and it's a, it's a bunch of hassle that you can avoid on the front end with some, a few phone calls and screening guys. Do not be afraid to pick up the phone. Uh, previous landlords are happy to give you, uh, rental references you know, because they're going to, they, they want to get rental references from the other landlords. So all the landlords want to help each other, you know, get good tenants. Like I had a situation, the guy wanted to move into one of my rooms and, um, and, you know, I called his uh, previous landlord and, um, you know, was not a favorable review, right? Come to find out like he's, uh, you know, delinquent with the previous landlord and, uh, and he's trying to move out into my place. Right. And so like, well, you know, I'm probably not going to rent to him, right? He's not uh, keeping his other guy up. So these are things you got to think about uh, and make sure you check on when you're renting a property. Uh, also check like how long they were there uh, and make sure that, you know, it, they were there for the whole length of their lease and stuff like that. Because if people skip out, they're probably going to skip out on you. Unfortunately, people are creatures of habit and, you know, past behaviors are typically indicate future tendencies. Um. So yeah, that's what you want to do to go ahead and screen people and get a good screening. Um, you know, just use, use your common sense, you know, use your, uh, your thinker. You know, if you feel like it's too good to be true, it probably is. And if you feel like somebody's solid, they probably are, you know, uh, make sure you give them a call, make sure you, you know, meet them in person if you can, but definitely call them, talk to them, you know, look them up on Facebook. If they have a Facebook, uh, those kind of things and uh, really get a full picture of what kind of person they are above just the financials and uh, and background. You know, you want to make sure that they're a good quality person, like that they're going to be clean. They're going to take care of your stuff. They're going to you know make sure that if they have pets, those kind of things, like these are the questions you got to ask and you know, how many people are going to be in the house, right? Like if your house is usually you want to only have two people per bedroom in your house, right? Any more than that. And it's probably too much for the property to handle or too much for the, uh, the house to handle, right? 
You can make exceptions to this, obviously, but these are good rules of thumb. I probably wouldn't have more than two pets. Um, you make sure you're charging pet fees and uh, pet rent. And um, with your with your leases, people are happy to pay. Everywhere charges uh, pet fees and pet rent. It's not going to be anything out of the normal. I think a lot of mom and pop landlords, they don't do these things probably because they don't think about them. Um, but people are happy to pay extra for their pets. And you should pay. You should make them pay extra because um, it's going to cost you additional money, perhaps when they end their lease, because uh, there's going to be more wear and tear to the property. You know, dogs and cats they scratch things up. They, you know, pee on the carpets. Even if you have really good tenants, sometimes there's uh, damage that will need extra money to repair at the end. And make sure these are non-refundable fees, guys. These are not deposits. They are fees. Deposits have to be refunded. Fees do not. So keep that in mind. Um, Kyle asks, how much do uh, we usually charge for pets? I will tell you. So um, let me get on here and let me pull it up. I have a, uh, this is, and this is, a, guys, I want to interject real quick with um, what I charge for pets fees. And there's also a couple extra cool ways you can make money, uh, like upsells on your uh, rental that you would probably not think about. So let me pull those up. So rental upsells. Um, let's see. Okay, so for pet policy, um, this is kind of the one that I've generally adopted. So I'm gonna um, put this here. There's a. This is the number of the landlord that I got it from. So I'm going to show this. Um, so we've got, so for pets, um, the pet fee, usually I charge like uh, for one pet, it's going to be about, you know, 395, maybe 295. It just kind of depends on the size of the unit. You could kind of gauge the price point because too high and some like, especially on lower end units, people, especially on lower end rentals, you know, people don't have a lot of cash sometimes. Um, and if it's a smaller square footage, it's less damage. So you might adjust that to like 295. Um, but definitely I would say minimum $300. Uh, and then like, you know, 600 or 500 for two pets. And then you can, if there's over, you know, if they're over certain sizes, um, you can charge more. So like say, for example, if a pet's under 25 pounds, probably uh, 25 a month. Um, and if they're over 25 pounds, it's going to be 50 a month. And this is per pet. So say they have one 25 pound pet and one uh, 50 pound pet, you know, it's a $75 a month on top of the fee, right? So you'd move them in $600 fee up front and then 75 extra a month um for that so like for example i've got a few places like i've got one place they have two small dogs uh and it's you know it's 50 a month for that right um you can adjust this sometimes i do you know 50 a month for uh you know one pet if it's say a bigger property um i've got one fairly big house it's like 2,000 square foot so it's like 50 a month per pet um yeah. So people don't usually, uh, you know, this is, they're, they're fine paying this stuff. So a couple of cool things you can do as well is, um, for, for making a little additional money, uh, is, is actually renting, um, appliances and to your, to your tenants. Right. And so the best ones are the non-standard ones like your fridge and your uh, washer dryer. So this is like my policies are right here. So, uh, I had a triplex and I've also done this in a house where I ran, and these are smaller fridges in the triplex. They were only like, the units are only like 450 square foot and the fridges were fairly cheap, like $300 a piece. So um, I charged the tenants $30 a month for fridges. And that's an extra, so the rent was only like 700 bucks, right? So an extra $30 for a fridge is a lot of money per rent. And that's, I mean, if you think of the ROI, it's gonna take you 10 months to pay that fridge off. I mean, you're making a, you know, a lot of extra rent proportionally for that property and the tenants are happy to pay because again, you know, people in these, uh, renters in general, um, don't have a lot of money saved up. Right. So like they're looking to finance everything in their life. And so you can, if you rent them, lease them a fridge, uh, for $40 a month, most of them are going to be like, Oh, that's cool. I don't have to, you know, go out and spend uh, $700 on a fridge. I can just pay, you know, an extra $40 a month, no problem. And, um, you're like, that's great. The fridge, you know, the fridge only cost me 600 bucks, right? So your, your cash on cash return on that little upsell is like, is, is crazy. You know, it's like over a hundred percent in the first year. And then and the fridge is going to last, you know, years and years, same with washer and dryer, 75 a month for the combo. 
Um, again, most people, they don't want to drop $1,000 on a washer and dryer. They're happy to pay seven to five a month. Um, haven't rented a washer and dryer yet, but I have rented about three fridges. So um, probably will in the next rental. So that's a great way to make money. Other ways you can also make money on, on upsells for is like uh, lawn care. Um, so like if you want to, you know, have somebody mow the yard or, or the grass, you can upsell the service to the, the tenant. And then you could probably actually negotiate with the uh, lawn care provider and get a cut of whatever they charge you um, to mow the grass, right? So like, or something like that. So you can make a little extra money on top of those services, which is going to really uh, massively improve the bottom line for uh, profitability on each unit. So that'll depend you know, on what the size of the yard is and stuff like that. Um but I would definitely charge them for that. There's also other things like snow removal you can charge. You could say just have a flat lawn care snow removal fee every single month and just add it to the rent. And as long as they agree to that on the lease, you want to make sure you write it, write it everything in writing and just, you know, tally all that stuff up. And they're going to be, you know, they can pay for all these extra services that are going to seriously increase the gross rents. And, you know, every little increase on the gross rents you can get is going to massively increase your profitability because, um, your fixed costs really aren't increasing at all. Like your mortgage, you know, maintenance, things like that. Okay. Um, anybody have any more questions here? We'll go into the next stage. So we've talked about um, leasing, talked about screening. Um, Facebook, I didn't talk about Facebook. I talked about Zillow mostly. Uh, I also list my properties on Facebook if I'm not getting activity on Zillow. Um, the thing about Facebook is that you are going to, it's good. There's a lot of people on there and in things you can, I have gotten renters from Facebook. It's just that um, there is a lot of time wasters on Facebook. Like the amount of people that, uh, you know, they send you, is this available? Is this available? Then you talk to them and they don't respond. Uh, and then, you know, when you actually like ask them to come and see the property, um, most people like don't show up. So like, even if they, you, you call them and they say that they're going to show up and you confirm you know, two hours, hour in advance, they still don't show up even after confirming. Like I would say the show up rate on a Zillow, on a rental, on a Facebook lead is like one in 10. And that's not even like an exaggeration. That's just like statistical fact based on my experience of like, and, and another tip where when you're showing properties, um, try to get them on a lockbox or something like that. So you don't have to go out there every time, but I would try to like open house your showings if you have to, because uh, and have everybody come at the same time because, like I said, most, if not all, the people won't show up to the showing even after you double confirm with them, right? So try to do that to alleviate um, you wasting your time as much as possible. Okay. All right. So, um, cool. We got three people on the stream. What a deal. Who's on the stream? Say hi in the comments. Say hi if you're watching. And if somebody has questions, then you want to hop on live, I can send you a link and uh, we can we can talk in the stream. What a deal. Um, so uh, let's see. So we've got a tenant. We've screened them. We've got them. Uh, we've got an application and we've screened them and they're good to go. Um, hey, oh, Kyle, what a guy. Two of you are silent. That's okay. So um, we've got a person now. What's next? So uh, the next thing is the uh, the showing. So you know sometimes you get an application before the showing. Sometimes you don't. But they're going to want to see the property. Um, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, I would recommend trying to automate this as much as you can. Um, there's really not a ton of selling you need to do when they're there. Um, Really, you just need to like if you can get a lockbox and you know have them take a picture of the key getting put back and things like that. I mean, most people are pretty respectful. Um, again, you know, I wouldn't be showing people that you don't think have a chance to begin with. Um, but uh, but yeah, but like if you have to show up there, go go check it out. Uh, I would just unlock the property. You'll make sure the lights are turned on and stuff, and just kind of let them let them walk around, let them do their thing. I usually just stand outside and let people, you know, kind of check stuff out for themselves. Uh, people like to kind of look at things and not feel like you're pressuring them because um, most rentals are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and then when they get done, you know, I like to tell them like, "Hey, uh, you know, if you'd like an application, I can give, I can send you one." Um, and this is the kind of my requirements. Answer any questions they have, and then. 
you know, try to, if they want to, if they want to uh, go and they want to do an application right there uh, and, and like, go ahead and uh, move forward, you want to try to close them right there. If you can, that's what I always try to do is push for the close um, while they see the property, if possible. Now, most people are going to want to look at a few places, so they might not do that. But uh, if you can, I would have them do an application right there. If you get uh, RIT ready, which let me pop up on the screen, um, you can also have them do, the, do this through uh, Zillow. So we can do, uh, let's see, screen share. All right, so we've got, let's see here. So we've got rent ready here. So um, you can go right here to rent ready. And this is really cool, guys. It's like I use this for all my nine properties. Um, link in the description. Uh, you can get a dollar or six months for a dollar, but it helps you uh, screen your tenants. So you can actually go right here like while you're standing in front of them and go to applications. And then you can invite a, a person to apply for the unit. It's super simple. So you just put their first name in, put their email in, and you just select whatever unit they're in. And this really doesn't matter because... Um, they uh, they don't you know the application will all be the same and then you just click invite and you can act, they can do that right there you can look at it right there this only takes them like you know 15 minutes maybe uh, and again like you know if people want to live there like they're gonna they'll do it so uh, that's a good uh, test as well for if they're serious or not um, but yeah so there you go you've uh, gone to apply. Uh, they've seen the place. They like it. Um, you have, uh, they, they have a good application. You like them, you know, process it, do the verifications, that sort of thing. And uh, the next step is to go ahead and sign a lease and collect the first month's rent and security deposit. So, um, so that's the next step. So you want to get a good lease. Um, I would, I have a lease that I use, you know, hit me up in the DM me or something. If you want a, a sample of my lease. Um, I would, you know, again, not legal advice, not financial advice, but I would probably run your lease by a local attorney. Um, a lot of uh, title companies and stuff and attorneys, they give you, they'll give you a free like Missouri, Kansas lease template um, that's already been looked through by a lawyer. Um, so I would probably just go ahead and start with one of those. It's already approved for the area. And um, then you can, you know, make any tweaks to it that you want. There's a lot of good boilerplate leases out there. Uh, but making sure the key things are like, you know, the property, the amount, the, uh, the how much the deposit is, what the term is, you know, like what the, uh, you know, your rules, your policies, things like that, like smoking policy, pet policy, guest policy, you know, who's responsible for the utilities, who's responsible for the lawn maintenance, all this stuff needs to be detailed. And you need to, if possible, you know, go through the lease with your prospective tenants to make sure that they're aware of your policies because most people probably aren't going to read it. Um, if you're in person, it's easier. You can run through it with them. If it's online, you can send them a dot loop. Um, try to do an e-sign if possible, just so you're not running out to sign with people. Um, get dot loop or DocuSign or something like that, and you can e-sign your leases. Uh, Rent Ready also has a, a way to sign leases in there as well, so you can actually accept an application to Rent Ready and then just go ahead and upload a lease and have them e-sign it. So that's what you got to do. And then before there, the lease doesn't mean anything ex until they pay, right? So the, they have to pay to execute the lease. And do not give them the keys to move in until they pay, okay? And they need to pay in full the uh, full, uh, they need to pay the uh, first month's rent and and, secu and refundable security deposit and any pet fees or anything like that that you're charging on the front end, okay? They, all the cash has to be collected before they move in. And this is critical. And again, if they want to move in, they will pay. So uh, make sure you're charging them all this stuff uh, before they move in. So that, you know, usually standard practice is a, is a full month's rent. Um, I charge the, uh, the refundable security deposit. I don't do first and last month's rent um, because I, you know, want to have that deposit in case, um, you know, there's any damages. Like if you just charge first and month and last, then... Uh, the last month's rent comes around, they don't pay, which because they already have paid it, and then they move out, and there's a bunch of damages you have to repair, and you don't have any money to do that, right? So this, the deposit is will help you ensure that um, people take better care of your property, and um, if they don't, then you have some money to, to pay for it. Um, Kyle asks, uh, anything you'd recommend? Absolutely, including in the including in the lease agreement. Um, um I mean. 
uh, you know, I, I don't know if there's anything you'd absolutely need to add. I mean, you want to be very clear about like, uh, like on the front end. So uh, one thing I do is like, if somebody's moving in on an odd day of the month, not like the first day of the month, um, you want to prorate the rent, but you want to make sure that the first payment is the full month's rent, right? So like, say the rent is a thousand dollars a month and they're going to move in on the, uh, the 15th, for example. Um, I'm charging them a thousand dollars, uh, in rent and then a thousand dollar security deposit. So it's a $2,000 to move in. And, um, then on the next month, so 15 days rolls by their own, they're going to pay me the prorated amount for last month. So like 500 bucks, they're going to pay that then. And then the next month it will resume normal payments. I would put that pay schedule in the lease. Um, I would also put like, if they have pets, I would outline, um, you know, what pets they are, how many, what types of animals and what the fees are for them. Same thing with all those extras, like the fridge, the washer dryer, the light landscaping. If you do that, I would outline all those payments and all those services in the lease. Make sure everything you do is in writing um, and all your policies are in writing in the lease. So that way, you know, like there's no confusion and you want to make sure they have a copy, you have a copy. So, you know, if anything ever were to, there was to be misunderstandings, um, you know, I, you got to make sure that, uh, that you can refer to this policy and be like, Hey, this is what it says. There's other things that like, I haven't seen a lot, but I have issues with like, sometimes like, like tampons, like a gal has like flushed a tampon down the toilet and there's like nothing in the lease. That's like, and she, she, you know, clogged the toilet. I had to, you know, it's like $150 sewer uh, or a plumber bill to clean that out. Right. Like there's things like that where it's like, it's, you know, it's their fault. Um, and I went ahead and split the bill with this tenant, but like you, those things should be outlined in there as well. Like, you know, hey, if you do this, or if you damage these things, like you're financially responsible for fixing them because like these things are going to damage my, pro I don't have any control over what they do inside, um, but I can't have control on what they pay for if they do these things. So those kind of things uh, are some things you don't think about immediately. Um, yeah, I mean, the biggest thing is like the terms, you know, uh, another big thing is like, what if they want to uh, uh, break the lease early is common. Um, I would charge them fees to break the lease uh, unless they're moving into, you know, another one of your properties or, um, you know, like you want them gone or something like that. Uh, like I would, I would charge a fee if they want to break the lease early, you know, I'm charging them, uh, probably a, another month's rent to break the fee, uh, break the fee so that that way or break the lease, because if they move out and, uh, and they, you also need to make sure that you know, give a minimum 30 days notice before they move out, uh, make sure to say like, that this lease renews as a month to month lease upon the completion of the first year. Most people, um, they probably won't move out, um, the, after the first year is over. So you want to make sure there's a clause in there to detail exactly what will happen when the lease ends. Uh, usually that would go to a month to month unless they, you want to lock them in for uh, another year. Right. Um, those are things you would do. Um, so for the lease, so make sure that you send them the lease, they sign, um, you have all those things in there. Again, I would get a lease for your locality. And then, um, the other thing I would do is you got to collect rent, right? So you need to collect it in certified funds. Okay. And that's really easy with like a rent ready, which I'll put up here. Um, so we've got, uh, rent ready is great because you can, um, get somebody in and then you can actually set up, um, you can set up payments, right? So like you go in here and you go to rent. You can go ahead and create a charge. So like you can, you know, you click create it and then you can actually select the unit and the tenant, and then you can just save it and it'll, it'll email that tenant and, um, and they'll, they'll, and it'll be like, Hey, you know, you have, you know, there'll be a portal to go in there and pay the, the whole charge. Like they'll, you know, you can tap, you know, make the whole one thing, like the, you know, rent and security deposit. Right. And then go in there and pay. And then like every single month, you can set it up to where they have to pay the rental charge, right? And they can pay that on rent ready with like, uh, you know, credit card. Um, they can pay with a bank. They can pay with, uh, with, with cash. If they go to like a gas station, they can actually pay the rent. Like there's a lot of different ways they can pay, um, virtually any way online or offline, they can pay the rent through rent ready. Okay. Um, other ways are like, you know, which are not as ideal, but are fine. It's like, uh, you know, cash app, um, Venmo, Zelle is great. Um, you know, I try to help tenants to avoid fees if possible. Um, 
I would not take checks uh, because they can bounce. I probably wouldn't take cash um, because you, know, you don't know where that cash is from and it's harder to trace. I would only do if it's like something physical, probably going to be money orders. I uh, have taken money orders for rent. That's certified funds. They have to take the cash to a uh, you know Walmart or a bank and get a money order, which means the bank has accepted the risk of the cash. Um, so yeah, make sure you collect all the rent and deposit and everything in advance and uh, before you give them the keys. And then once you do that, um, you've collected, they've signed, they are legally your tenant and um, you should give them the keys and let them move in. Uh, if they, and then ongoing, you know, you want to make sure that, uh, I, I, and when I'm talking to tenants, like, especially when I'm signing the lease, collecting that money, like I tell them like, you know, Hey, like I'm a cool landlord, like I'm chill, but you know, Hey, if you, uh, you know, if you, I, that, that you need to have oh, another cool, another thing that needs to be in the, in the lease a hundred percent is late fees. And what will happen? Like, like for me, like if they're, the rent is like due on the first, but they don't get a late fee until the sixth. So if the late, if the, if they pay the rent on the sixth of the month, it's like $50 late fee. Okay. And then it's $25 a day extra after that. Right. So like there's clearly outlined, uh, how much it's going to be and you have to charge late fees or there's no reason for the tenant to pay. Another trick that I've, I've heard about, which I haven't implemented yet is actually, um, is a, a early pay discount, which in reality is, is basically a late fee. Um, but it's, it's probably more effective. So like, say I want to get, um, 1400 or like a thousand dollars for a property. I'm going to put on the lease that the, that the rent is a thousand fifty dollars, but they get an early a $50 discount if they pay before the first of a thousand bucks. Right. So they get a $50 discount, but it's really just the rent I wanted to collect anyway. And you'll probably get pretty a lot better compliance that way because people want to get that discount. They want to pay before the first. Uh, and then you want to still have late fees after that, right? So then you're getting basically an automatic late fee on the second of the month, but they don't see it as a late fee. They see it as an early pay discount. Um, I would try that. That's I think that would work pretty well. Um, and, you know, if people are not paying, they need to, you need to, you need to tell them in advance, like, hey, like this is what's going to happen if you don't pay. You know, you're going to get a late fee and then, um, you know, you're going to have to find another place to live pretty fast. Uh, or, you know, if you, if you don't pay for whatever reason, like I'll work with you, if you have some situation, if you communicate, but you know, you're going to need to find, you're going to have a better, bad situation if you stop paying for whatever reason. Uh, and that's just the way it's going to be. You know, I'm running a business here. You want to be, you know, uh, you know, fair, but firm with folks, because, um, again, you've got payments, you've got family to feed, like people can't be getting behind on their rent. Like I've got a guy right now, you know, he's behind on his rent and it's just, people will give you a thousand excuses in the book for why they can't pay. And it's like, it isn't your problem to, you know, you can try to help them find ways to pay like rental assistance and things like that. But like people got to prioritize paying the rent. And um, so it's your job to hold them accountable by charging them late fees and getting on them every single day to, if they, if they get late to get that done, because if you're not getting on them, it's not going to be a priority for them until um, you know, they're getting evicted or, or whatever to, uh, to get out. Um, so yeah, that's how you get a good tenant in. Um, you know, if you get it, if you screen them right, get them in good, you're probably gonna have a great relationship with them. Uh, it's going to be a really good experience. I have had a great experience as a landlord so far with my nine units. I really haven't had, uh, you know, very many issues at all with my tenants. Um, you know, 95% of the time, you know, all of them are paying on time. They're taking good care of the properties and uh, I'm making, you know, very, uh, very passive income every single month. Uh, and, you know, building passive income and financial freedom. So, yeah, guys, if you have any questions, um, I can answer those now. We'll wrap up in just a couple, couple minutes. I hope you've enjoyed this training on how to get tenants. I really appreciate you joining, Kyle. What a great OG. Kyle Devlin. Um, so as we build up the audience here. Uh, but if you have any questions, ask them now. And, uh, and uh, you know, if you need any help, please feel free to... Uh, ask me that in the future or at any time you can reach out to me on uh, YouTube or Instagram or Facebook. I'm active on all those things. Um, but yeah, so let's see. I think that's uh, pretty much it. You know, just uh, stay on people and screen people right. And uh, thanks, Kyle. Great information. Always helpful. Appreciate you. But uh, yeah, so with that, guys, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up and close out. Thank you for coming. And we'll be here next week uh, on Tuesday in the afternoon, probably about three o'clock for another live stream topic. So Dan Cohan, go ahead and subscribe, like the video, uh, comment, 
if you have any questions and uh, subscribe for more and we will see you in the next chapter.